So I chose to do my uh, final project on the psychology of advertising. Like, not uh, the effects of advertising on individuals, more how advertising utilizes psychology to sell more products and services. So a little bit of background on advertising. It's actually really recently that we got into the sort of advertising era that we are in. As of now, uh, up until about... The 1850s, most advertising was through word of mouth, you know, like haggling in the streets and all that. Uh, the first advertisement in English appeared in 1648, like in a newspaper, but it, modern advertising didn't really start until about 1864, you know, well into the second industrial revolution, uh, like when goods were really taken off, and that's when stuff started showing up in magazines and, uh... Adverts and newspapers, all that. And by 1904, here's a quote, The day of reckless, sporadic, haphazard advertising is rapidly coming to an end. When he says that, it, it's because there was a lot more competition by the early 1900s. This was shortly before the outbreak of World War I, and finally when all these industrial goods were really coming together and making everything easier. People had more spending power, uh, because they were getting more rights and everything. Uh, wages were going up. Generally, people were just able to afford more, so advertising made more sense. And there were more goods. Mass production was cheaper than ever. Uh, yeah. Advertising was exploding by 1904. And businesses were becoming competitive in ways never seen before, so advertising had to follow suit. Many advertisers turned to psychology to learn the secrets of the human mind. You know, they they had to because there were so many products on the market, and mass production was so big. There were more and more firms competing, and people were more and more aware of these other firms, so people really had to utilize advertising in order to get a foothold in the consumer market. So I'm gonna just show you a brief before and after. Basically, people really had to do better advertising, really, you know? So, <laughs> guess what, uh... Guess what this advertisement is about? You know, it reads, The Knab. Its successful growth and experience of nearly 70 years guarantees to new friends the greatest degree of to tried and tested excellence, judged from any standpoint of criticism or comparison. Now, that doesn't seem like a very descriptive advertisement, and no picture was included along with it. So, it, it's really a big guess as to what this is about. There's no description about what the actual product was and a lot of advertisements up to this point were similar to it to this sort of ambiguous sort of advertisement this was actually about a piano and you definitely wouldn't have guessed that based on uh based on the ad alone they really needed to step up their game, you know, and make it actually clear what these products and everything was about. So even by the 1900s, advertising was still a new field. Like I said, it didn't really reach its modern form, like getting put in magazines and stuff till the 1850s, so it was still really new. And everybody wanted in, but not everyone really knew how to do it effectively. And advertisements, as more and more firms got the money, uh, to put adverts in papers and magazines, uh, they became more and more expensive. So they had to be worth, they had to have good payouts in order to justify all the money going in to putting them in the ad in the papers in the first place. So a lot of businessmen decided they needed to utilize psychological techniques, and psychology was a an emerging field at the same point in time, so it was really a pioneering sort of idea from these businessmen. So, uh, by the 1950s, there was really an advertisement revolution. Like, there'd been a real uptake in advertising before World War I, uh, because of all the industrial capabilities, and then between World War I and World War II, before the Great Depression, there was a huge boom as well. Uh, but it wasn't until after World War II, when the fallout of the war had finally, uh, sort of dissipated and the economies had finally bounced back, advertising bounced back with it, and this was really the beginning of the era of the mass corporations and all the advertising campaigns. 
like, uh, you know, that very famous show Mad Men was set in the 1950s all about advertising. People generally, before psychology became, like, widespread knowledge, tended to assume that all people responded the same way to any kind of stimulus, including, like, ads. Finally, by this period, people had started to realize that even if what they're exposed to is identical, different minds interpret them in different ways, and that was sort of how target audiences were invented. Where I want to start applying some psychological concepts to advertising, I, I want to start with uh, Gestalt principles. This sort of uh, graphic gives you a quick review of that, of what Gestalt principles were all about. There are like a, there, there's a couple of different main principles. There's closure, proximity, continuation, similarity. The closure, you, you see that G, there's a line through it, so even though it might seem like two separate figures, people s still see that as a G. Like proximity, all those squares could be nothing, but uh, we see them close to each other and we're like, oh, that's an E. You know, that's, that's sort of what Gestalt is about. It's all about uh, examining total uh, experience. Like, Gestalt psychology was sort of a reaction to structuralism. It was founded by Max Wertheimer. He tried to examine, like, a person's total experience because structuralism was all about dividing parts of the brain and reactions and everything into very discrete parts. They, they didn't really look at the big picture. Advertisers used uh, gestalt processes, in like television especially, to focus on how viewers like respond to entire messages, not just like the parts. You gotta take into account the music in the background, the people involved, your, your actors, just the general vibe that the advertisement gives off the coloring even. The response varies from viewer to viewer depending on age, emotional background, physical condition, level of education. Uh, we kind of covered that also, like how you want to have certain types of advertising. Based on how intelligent uh, your target audience is, you want to appeal to the facts or appeal more to the emotions, like we covered that a bit in one of our later units. Advertisers, they, they learned by this time, they need to sort of figure out who their target audience is and then edit their message based on who that target audience is. They want their target audience to share, you know, common gestalt responses. So one of the uh, gestalt laws or principles, I guess, is the law of proximity, which is uh, what I, I kind of went over this earlier, but our minds, with the uh, E, our minds will group things together if they're close to each other. So, like, uh, you see all these little circles in the uh, orange square like we we don't see those as separate circles we don't really see that we see them as like a square advertisers use that kind of idea like one thing being close to another and they they're sort of associated that's why they uh use like famous figures or celebrities in advertising a lot of their goods because people learn to associate that celebrity with whatever they're trying to sell that's also why people put similar items together in grocery stores, like, uh, complementary goods, uh, you might call it in e economics. Like, uh, hollandaise and asparagus, you want to put them close to each other. Or in back-to-school shopping, you want to put, like, the pencils and the notebooks next to each other because people associate them. So then there's the law or principle of closure, which is what I was saying with the G earlier. When we look at complex arrangements, we try to look for, like, a single visual pattern. And visual marketers realize that our brains do that. It makes it more engaging when it's like that. And th there's some examples of this, some good examples, like uh, the uh, Apple logo. Our minds are more engaged and they're doing more when they're looking at those uh, logos. So we're more engaged in what the advertiser is trying to say. And then there's the uh, law of similarity, which is when things seem to be similar to each other, we group them together. Like, that, that sounds a little like the law of proximity, but it's not quite what that is. A, a lot of the times, the law of similarity is used in advertising by breaking it. Like, you want to draw attention to a button on a website, for example. Uh, you might, like, make the donate here button a different color than the general background. Okay, and that's, that's pretty much it for Gestalt principles, but there's also uh, a couple other concepts I want to link to advertising. 
So, first off, people naturally gravitate towards symmetrical images. We kind of covered that this year. Like, people are more attracted to people with symmetrical faces. It's just more pleasing to us. People prefer sym symmetry in advertising, too, obviously. And you can do that in a lot of different ways. So advertisers, like, use uh, symmetry with who they hire for acting. Like I said, uh, we tend to uh, prefer people who have symmetrical faces. You can even have symmetry in, like, the words that you're saying or you're putting down on the screen. Even in, like, your structure of speech. Like, you want repetition. You want the same kind of sentence structure. It's more appealing to the viewer or reader. And symmetry also has like a calming effect really interestingly actually which is really useful when advertisers are trying to market a riskier kind of product advertisements for beer and cigarettes for example really uh, commonly try to produce that kind of calming effect through symmetry images uh, tend to be the best way for uh, advertisers to pull consumer cu customers in it's been found that people remember what they see in much higher percentages than what they heard or read. And the human brain processes visual images much faster than text. Another part of that images thing is color is, like, really big and really important. Okay, and then more on, uh, you know, impulse buying. Uh, the neocortex, uh, in the front of our brains, that, uh, controls, like, obsessive, compulsive type behavior and flight or fight responses. And using words like now, using that kind the, that kind of language uh, can trigger impulse buys. It, it implies a sense of urgency almost. Another uh, major part of advertising is, as I said earlier, knowing who your audience is, who, who you want to connect to. So reason versus emotion is a big thing, and that has partially to do with how educated your audience is. But generally, it's found that advertising campaigns that perform well tend to be emotional. Uh, like one study found that 31% of, of emotional content-based advertising campaigns performed well, while only 16% of rational content performed well. Emotional advertising is usually easier and more wide-reaching, so that's what most advertisers go with. There tends to be two ways of getting an emotive response, based on empathy or based on creativity. So, like, empathy is, like, the sympathetic sort of advertisements, you know, the, the ones where there's babies and cats and sad music playing in the background. Uh, and then there's the creative responses, which are more uh, individual watching the ad base. Th these sort of responses happen when an ad makes people feel like almost inspired. They feel like the brand's imaginative, they have- they feel like it's doing something good, maybe. A, a big reason why emotional ads tend to do better is that emotional arousal, it, it tends to- it, it causes an outpouring of stress hormones, which increase activity in the brain's memory-forming area, so those ads uh, literally stick better in your mind. So, some- Themes that show up a lot in emotion-based ads are pride, love, uh, unique achievement, man's empathy, loneliness, uh, memories. The, the best emotions for keeping viewers engaged are joy and shock. You know, you, you want to keep their emotions running high. Brands like Coca-Cola, they bring emotion to their companies, you know, like their whole vibe, by incorporating, like, slogans, like, taste the feeling. Smiling images connecting to American identity. So, this neuroscientist called Antonio Damasio actually found a really interesting link between uh, emotion and decision making. He found that when patients had damage to their orbitofrontal cortex, the part of the brain that has the uh, feelings of emotions, they really struggle with making even the simplest of decisions based on logic alone. It shows that emotion is important to any decision, uh, and that includes purchasing. Trust is also really big with companies, especially big companies. Like Spirit Airlines. That's probably not your go-to airline, is all I'm saying. Connecting, with, uh, connecting ads with patriotism, community, childhood, uh, those are all big. You know, a lot of those advertisements from childhood, I know, stick out in my brain. Like, 
2300 Empire. That's why kids are such a big market. As for modern advertising, in the 1970s, uh, the average American saw about 500 ads a day. We are currently exposed to an average of 6,000 a day. All that exposure leads to a lot of apathy. Uh, people reduce how much attention they give to any content because of the sheer volume. Like, constant overload leads to desensitization. People just shut off their brains when they're exposed to it so much. You can really see the difference because ads are just so linked into the modern uh, sphere now. Like, the, the way of life almost of the average American, I know. Back in the 20s and 50s, there was still like a novel thing. And they were as big as the content itself that you were watching or reading. Like families would go through all these ads. It was it was like an event on its own. Now one of the best ways to get ads to stick out in people's minds is just the sheer volume of times they're seen. Like, you've all probably seen that one vaping ad. Part of the reason that the sheer volume works is uh, the mere exposure effect. The more you're exposed to something, basically that says, uh, the more likely you are to enjoy it or be more agreeable to it. So advertisements tend to have variable inter interval schedules. So they reinforce behavior at unpredictable time intervals, uh, which has a pretty good response rate. You retain information better when it's distributed. Distri distributed over time. That's, again, why seeing it at, at multiple times works well. There's also something called the spacing effect, which is uh, the tendency for distributed study or practice to yield better long-term retention. Another big thing is if new information is not meaningful, we have trouble processing it, which is why so many ads, as soon as we see them, they just go pfft, right out of our head. Some other stuff that's linked with modern advertising. Self-control, uh, so that's defined as the ability to control impulses and delay short-term gratification for longer-term rewards. We're pounded with advertisements so much that that kind of breaks down self-control. Like, we're exposed to it so much that at some point something has to give, unless you're, like, truly apathetic and, like, nothing catches your eye, which is also widespread. Think about, like, kids and ads. Like, if you're a parent, uh, and your kid sees this ad about, like, a pillow pet multiple times in a day, they're going to nag that parent 24-7 to buy that product. If they give in to that kid, that's negative reinforcement almost. Like, that's taking away a negative stimulus, like the kid whining and crying all about it. Also, uh, there's some interesting stuff that you might apply with political or so-called informational ads, uh, like, the com like confirmation bias and the availability heuristic. Confirmation bias is the tendency to search for information that supports our preconceptions and, like, ignore or distort con con uh, contradictory evidence. That's why this is especially relevant with political ads. Like, if you're seeing something that you already staunchly believe, uh, then seeing it again in an ad is just going to make you more headfirst and strong about it. Or if the opposite, it's something you don't like, you'll, you'll find an excuse as to why that fact isn't true. And then there's availability heuristic, which is estimating the likelihood events of events based on like how recently you think of something or how easily it comes into mind. Like, uh, if you've just seen something about a shark attack or, like, about plane crashes, or about overdosing on a drug, like the Just Say No ads, uh, then you're probably going to be less likely to indulge in some of that behavior. At this point, the question is probably, like, as I've said, audiences are increasingly apathetic to advertisements, so companies have had to get increasingly, uh, competitive with how they market their goods and services. So I'm just going to give a quick example about um, Pepsi's 2008 logo rebranding. I'm sure if some of you have seen these pictures. Relativity of space and time versus Pepsi proposition uh, in Pepsi aisle. It's, it's 
Pepsi universe. These are genuine images from uh, this rebranding. And this <laughs> rebranding cost them a, a million dollars. It seems almost like science has been stretched a little far. I guess I'm going to wrap this up by connecting to some psychological approaches. Uh, I've connected it to previous units throughout the slide deck. Uh, concepts, all that. I hope I don't have to state those explicitly for credit. Um, so as you've probably noticed by now, uh, nostalgia, uh, connection to ads... Ads are kind of ingrained in Western, especially American, culture by now. Advertising impacts our society, encouraging materialism, more impulse spending, consumerism. Uh, and I, I wanted to connect this to the sociocultural approach. Uh, I feel like there are actual uh, effects on our culture because of advertising. Like, uh, the amount of advertising that goes into fast food and uh, sugary cereals and everything probably explains a little bit of our uh, obesity problem. You know, Air Jordans and other stuff that's advertised constantly. I mean, it's, material goods are actually linked to status. There's the behaviorism, the behaviorist approach. And I feel like that's that also has a lot to do with ads. Like the negative reinforcement I mentioned with parents earlier, first off, that's a good example. And then also, the good feeling you get uh, from buying a product or being praised for having the latest cell phone or Air Jordans, that's all reinforcement of a kind. Uh, or when you buy something from a sale, like, oh, I got it for less than the normal cost. I, uh, I've done something good for my finances, probably. Not actually. But that all is a conditioning of a kind. Uh, and then hearing jingles or phrases or slogans that make you immediately think of an ad or a product, that's all conditioning. Like, we are farmers. Uh, and then, finally, I want to connect uh, color, that was a big thing, to the biological approach. So, studies have shown uh, that brain receptors affect color choice in humans. Like, we tend to like colors that are common in our environments, uh, which is why blue is a lot of people's favorite color. Like, everyone, there's the blue sky in most places. And, uh, I believe that's everything. Uh, thank you for your time. Goodbye.